All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for welcoming uh, Dr. John to uh, our Grand Rounds. We are back to our virtual format um, at this time. Our speaker today is Dr. John. He's a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill, University of Louisville Medical School, and UAB Orthopedic Residency. He's been in the Roanoke Valley since completing his sports medicine fellowship at Mississippi Sports Medicine in Jackson, Mississippi in 2004. First with the Roanoke Orthopedic Center and then with the Carillion Clinic Orthopedics since 2010. He's a team physician for Patrick Henry High School, Virginia Military Institute and Southern Virginia University. He has been an assistant professor with VTC SOM since its inception. His clinical areas of interest are shoulder, elbow, and knee arthroscopy, sports and overuse injuries in general. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for bearing with us with the virtual format here again, unfortunately, and hopefully we can talk for 45 minutes to an hour about something other than COVID. Uh, can everybody hear, or Janie, you can hear me fine? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thanks. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about adolescence shoulder instability. Uh, obviously, that's a little bit of a broad topic, but we'll just try to hit the high points and um, go over things here. And then if anyone has questions in the chat, uh, kind of broken the talk up into segments and then, you know, we'll have a question and answer at the end. Uh, let's see. All right, no financial disclosures. Uh, so we're gonna summarize the pertinent anatomy of the shoulder joint. Uh, we'll go over sort of some history and physical exam pointers and pearls uh, that I talk to when I talk to my patients and their families about shoulder instability. We'll talk about some different types of shoulder instability and then talk a little bit about treatment uh, just so you kind of know what, what we're doing when you send them over. Um, so here's just sort of your basic cartoon about shoulder anatomy that everybody knows. And so the most important things, you know, that we'll talk with our patients about and, you know, for you all to know is that, you know, obviously the shoulder anatomically does not have a lot of stability. So we talk about the golf tee analogy. Uh, we talk about that the shoulder is not a true ball and socket joint. So it does have, um, Sometimes we'll talk about it's sort of like a saute pan or fry pan. So the glenoid itself does not have a lot of inherent stability. So you have your dynamic restraints, which is the rotator cuff and your scapular stabilizer muscles. And then the static restraints, which are the labrum, the capsule and the glenohumeral ligaments, which we'll talk about. Um, that anterior band of the IGHL is kind of the most important restraint and abduction and external rotation, which is the most common way that a shoulder will come out of socket traumatically. All right, so this slide's a little busy, but this just kind of goes over those glenohumeral ligaments. You know, a glenohumeral ligament is not like an ACL or an MCL. It's really just a thickening of the capsule and let me move my little, you guys can't see it, but move my little chat thing out of the way. But so this is your biceps tendon, uh, then your superior glenohumeral ligament, middle glenohumeral ligament, and inferior glenohumeral ligament. And as you get up higher it, with your shoulder like this, your inferior glenohumeral ligament is more involved. And at lower levels, it's 45 degrees as your middle and then your superior glenohumeral ligament is at the lower levels. And that will also go, we'll talk about this later, sort of the bigger the tear or the more unstable the patient, they'll have instability at lower levels or with just activities of daily living. All right, so then rotator cuff is really important, you know, that when we talk about doing rehab for shoulders, you're prim primarily doing the rotator cuff and the scapular stabilizers. You know, they've actually done EMG studies and, you know, all your rotator cuff will be active through your full range of motion. Um, and it helps hold the humeral head in, in the center of the glenoid throughout the arc of motion. It almost creates like a compressive force that helps stabilize the joint. So one thing we really like to talk about and that I learned uh, 
you know, way back when in my fellowship is that scapulothoracic stability is really important. And we'll talk about that later in the talk towards the end. But if you have failure of your scapula stabilizer muscles, uh, the it allows more abnormal translation. So the, we'll hit on this again is your trapezius, especially your lower traps, your serratus anterior, and your rhomboids all help stabilize the scapula. This guy's had a bad day. All right, so that's kind of hitting the high points of the anatomy. Uh, so taking your history, this is sort of just the normal orthopedic stuff, and then we're going to talk a little bit later about maybe some more specific things for shoulder instability, especially anterior instability. But you know, for us, we want to know their age, hand dominance, uh, what sports they do. How did, you know, what sort of trauma started this, or was it kind of a minimally traumatic thing? How long ago it was? Uh, we don't have to read through the whole thing, but numbness and tingling is something I ask about, you know, um, sometimes with shoulder instability, they'll also get some thoracic outlet, which will be tightness of their scaling muscles and just sort of the muscles around the clavicle. And so, if, especially with like a multi-directional instability, they might have some numbness and tingling or sort of weakness type things, um, you know, and then asking about mechanical symptoms like grinding or popping. You know, I always ask if somebody says, you know, does your shoulder pop? Is, well, does it, the follow-up question is, well, does it hurt when it pops or just feel a little weird? It's not uncommon for people's shoulders to pop, you know, when you circumduct the shoulder. Um, this is just talking about the physical exam. You know, it's just important to, you know, there's things we talk about in med school is like look at the um, symmetry of the shoulder. You know, this is obviously an older patient, but, you know, looking for their biceps. But, you know, the biggest thing is really looking at any atrophy around the supraspinatus fossa, infraspinatus fossa, and then looking for that scapula sort of winging or compensation type maneuver. Uh, so palpation, you know, the main things we palpate or you start at your sternoclavicular joint, go out to your AC joint, uh, look, feel over the biceps tendon and the coracoid process, you know, along the acromion and then sort of along the scapula. Uh, those are kind of the most common palpation areas. Um, a lot of times people that have, you know, sh shoulder pain or some instability will have some tenderness over uh the coracoid process or or kind of the biceps um that's usually because like their pectoralis minor will have some tightness there we'll talk about that later as well um, for just plain shoulder instability they may not have any specific tenderness at all um, <clears throat> all right so physical exam i'm not great with videos but uh so i tried to and it looks like you can see me hopefully in the video, but, you know, we talk about strength, muscle atrophy and the scapular winging, uh, motor and sensor exam, range of motion. Uh, I've got another slide about the Baton score for hyperlaxity. Uh, so the special tests are what's called a sulcus sign. And that's one thing we look at for this sort of inherent underlying instability. It's, it's not on the Baton score, uh, but this is the sulcus test up in the top left so you just kind of gently take the sh the elbow and pull down and it's one finger breath as a one plus sulcus two finger breaths is a two plus sulcus and it's always good and show you know in orthopedics we can always check the other side and look for comparison it's always interesting to me that probably 90 percent of multi-directional instability is bilateral but they almost always only have one shoulder that's uh, symptomatic. Um, so a load shift uh, is showing here. Uh, often we'll do it at different levels, just like we were talking about. So you're checking at a higher level, you know, middle level, and then and then lower. <clears throat> and uh, so basically, just put your thumb on the back of the shoulder and push forward or or backwards. Two plus is out of the joint. One plus is sort of that you feel it sublux. You know, I would say realize that in a young female that you should be able to push the shoulder forward and backwards at least to a one plus position. 
Um, the apprehension test is pretty helpful, especially anterior instability, and that's where I have another slide on that. Uh, let's see, next one. All right, so this is the apprehension test on the right. So you kind of put the patient on the edge of the table and put their arm backwards, and they should feel a sense of apprehension that they're sh or just uncomfortable that the shoulder is going to come out. Um, and then when you push down to relocate it, uh, that should make them feel better. Uh, it doesn't technically get, it's going to be relocating it because uh, the shoulder is not going to pop out in that position, but it should, they should feel better and more stable. If they have positive apprehension, but the relocation is negative, you know, that makes it a little bit more equivocal. Uh, this is just showing another sulcus test and, a, and the load shift test. Um, so now we're going to talk. So first of all, I've got this slide about the Baton score. You know, there's some controversy about that. Most people will say a score of five uh, to six uh, is a sign of high, high sorry, uh, <laughs> laxity, uh, pathologic laxity. Uh, so it's putting your hands on the floor with your knees straight. Can you hyperextend your elbows? Can you hyperextend your knees? Uh, can you bring your thumb back to touch your forearm? Or can you bend your little finger up at 90 degrees to the back of your hand? Um, another one is just are your thumbs double jointed? <clears throat> and that just gives you an idea of whether someone has hyperlaxity or not. Um, all right, so not all instability is the same. So, you know, somebody can have a big shoulder dislocation, uh, posterior shoulder dislocation. You can have fractures. Uh, you can have a patient like this who's just really, really lax uh, uh, or has somebody that has this big, ugly fracture, big uh, reverse hill sax deformity. That's actually this x ray here. You know, that x ray doesn't look that bad. You can see a little thing right at the bottom here. But this is what the CAT scan looks like. All right, so AC separations, uh, you know, the typical mechanism, what you're thinking of, and a lot of these with the instability, you can get it from the history. But uh, it's usually a fall or blow just at the point of the shoulder. We see it in football a lot, uh, wrestling as well. If they have increased force, increased damage. So the main structural things are your. Um, trapezoid and conoid ligaments, which is your core coclavicular ligaments, and then your AC ligament. Um, sometimes you can just fall on an outstretched arm, and that's usually more kind of the grade one AC separation. So most of our treatments conservative, you know, ice and analgesics, sling for a week to two weeks for comfort. Uh, you start some range of motion, and then they're usually able to return to sport when functional activity and they're pain free. Um, I think a grade one AC separation, I mean, if they hurt right over the AC joint, they have nothing abnormal on their x-ray, you know, I don't think that merits or, or needs an orthopedic referral. We're always happy to see them. Um, but if you feel a deformity or a bump there, you know, I think they always should be seen uh, by one of us. You know, realize also, I didn't get into this a whole lot, but, you know, technically in the kids, you know, even up to age 20 or so, technically what you have with an AC separation is a distal clavicle physeal separation. So, they don't, you don't really treat it any differently than a 23-year-old who has an AC separation, but it's just kind of one of these knowledge points to know. It is one reason why a kid who has a grade one AC separation or a mild grade two, you know, that you don't want to be too aggressive returning them to play because they could do potentially some damage to the physis. Um, the grade three separations are the ones where it's 100% displaced. Uh, those are rare in kids. Uh, those are ones you want to see a little bit quicker. Uh, most of our research tells us you know, lean more still towards a conservative approach, but surgery is an option sometimes depending on where they are in their season or uh, with season coming up, their dominant arm, what sport they play. But there's even some good studies that show even in throwers that a grade three AC separation can be treated conservatively. The um, 
the grade four, five, and six, uh, which is a uh, grade five is where it's displaced 200% or more. A grade four is where it goes back posteriorly. Those are the ones that need surgery. Um, everybody's favorite sort of thing that they see is uh, the popping sternoclavicular joint. Um, not really, but uh, basically an anterior sternoclavicular separation is typically treated with sort of benign neglect. So we put them in a sling for a couple of weeks. Again, that can be a physeal injury too. And even if they have some popping and discomfort, usually we just try to reassure them there's nothing bad wrong. And uh, luckily, because it is a physeal injury, usually it'll sort of scar in there eventually. Um, a posterior one is a lot more serious. You're not usually going to see that in the office, but if you do, uh, you know, you really want to make sure their nerves are working, that you're able to swallow. Uh, because there can be pressure on the trachea and the deeper structures. So they really need to go, you know, to the ER right away. So if you're ever concerned about the posterior instability, you want to send those on right away or see them, you know, you're watching one of your kids at a football game or soccer game and they call you in. Um, now, shoulder instability. So <clears throat> We've obviously got um, anterior, posterior. We're not going to talk really about slap tears or MGHL too much. Uh, multidirectional instability is, uh, you know, an interest of mine, and we'll talk about that also at the end as well as the scapulothoracic. So these are kind of the specific history things that you'll see for a shoulder instability, or that we want to talk about with our patients. So. You're going to treat this guy with his rugby injury differently than our hyperlax person here. So, you know, if somebody comes in, they say, my shoulder is un feels we loose or it's popping out. Uh, first thing you ask is, is it just popping or is it actually feel like the joints popping out? Uh, when did it first happen and what were you doing? You know, so if it was a more traumatic episode, um, that is different than somebody who, you know, is just reaching for something or throwing something and their shoulder feels unstable. Um, you know, did it require reduction? I mean, did they have to go to the ER? Did, did an athletic trainer have to kind of push it back into place? Um, what direction did it go? Did it get, seem like it went to the front or did it seem like to, it went to the back? Um, your arm dominance. And then uh, we talked about uh, which sports they play. So you're going to treat a wrestler, you know, different than a swimmer. Um, and then comorbidities, uh, this sort of normal things to ask. A lot of that is that sort of hyperlaxity. You ask about a family history. You know, does anyone else in your family have problems with, with laxity? All right. So your anterior shoulder dislocation, you know, they're going to have significant pain. I mean, it, when it's dislocated for most people. Uh, you know, they're going to lose this deltoid contour. Uh, the arm usually is going to be kind of out to the side. Uh, you want to make sure, maybe not necessarily on the field, but, you know, you want to see if the axillary nerve wor is working, which is usually checking the sensory right here over the deltoid. Um, so your first step is always just recognition. You know, when I see somebody on the field during a game, you know, I want to ask the trainer, has this happened before or is this the first time? And then, you know, how it happened, did their arm get sort of caught behind them? Did they get pushed backwards? Um, all those kind of things, you know, can help you. These are sort of the historical reduction techniques. I'm not going to get too much into these today. Uh, I thought it was interesting. This is actually called the Hippocrates method. The Stimson one is actually nice. If you ever really get into a, a bind somewhere and you don't feel comfortable, you know, pulling on somebody, you know, you can get them up on a training table or something like that and attach a, a weight or something to them. And it works basically every time. Uh, there's a nice YouTube video about the milch technique, which is nice, which is a pretty atraumatic technique. Um, where you just sort of gradually externally rotate the arm 
and that really works pretty well. But you don't want to be in this situation where you're the guy with the with the foot in the axilla and trying to pull on it like that and at the game that doesn't look good. That's nice to have the tents for that. Uh, all right, so treatment of shoulder instability. Uh, one of the things came out in the early 2000s when I was in fellowship was this study out of Korea, and they looked at if somebody's um, immobilized an external rotation, which doesn't make a lot of inherent sense because you would think it would be stretching the front of the shoulder, that they, at their early results, like a year to two years, they said it was had 30% improvement in stability levels. Um, unfortunately, when they got to their midterm results, it didn't make a difference. And when people tried to uh, repeat the study here in the US or in Europe, it didn't seem to work. So we had about a six month or a year period where people experimented with immobilization kind of out in this area, externally rotated and um, it didn't seem to make a difference. Same way with just the duration of immobilization, you know, whether you do it for one week or two weeks or four weeks, it doesn't really seem to make a difference in someone's recurrence rate. Um, so in general, sling is for comfort, you know, and once a patient comes back and they feel comfortable moving their shoulder, uh, <clears throat> you know, they can come out of the sling. What I do tell the patients, especially with a traumatic dislocation, is to avoid that abducted, externally rotated position. Um, and that's typically for about three to four weeks for a first time dislocator. You know, you, about the earliest you can typically get somebody back to a contact sport. It depends a little bit on their position, but uh, would be three to four weeks. I've seen kids be able to get back in two weeks um, and we'll talk about the return to play here in a minute. So in general, there's really no benefit to extended lengths of immobilization, strapping the arm to their body or putting their arm in a specific position when they're uh, dislocated. So our return to play criteria, you know, they don't really want them to have pain. Uh, you want them to have essentially a normal range of motion. Uh, you want them to have normal rotator cuff strength. Uh, you can put them through some functional tests um, and then be able to have their normal sport specific skills. Ideally, they wouldn't have that positive apprehension. You know, if they have just a little bit, you know, that's probably okay. But I want them, and this goes for a patient who's dislocated two or three times playing basketball or football, and we pop it back in and they sometimes they don't have very little pain, so they want to go back sooner. You know, you want them to be able to get through a full range of motion and have a normal symmetric strength exam because they've got to be able to protect themselves or you risk doing further damage. So way back to 1950, you know, there were 90% of the patients less than 20 years old had recurrence of shoulder instability. Uh, getting to be a little bit more recent to 1982, we have an 88%. I mean, that's perhaps shocking to people. I mean, and this is for traumatic instability. Uh, the common number I'll say is 70 to 75%, uh, but it's high. It's it's really high, in a, especially in a contact sport athlete uh, who dislocates their shoulder. So, one of the things we'll talk just a little bit about treatment, you know, is that we've looked at studies now, and a lot of this came out of the military, is that, uh, you know, doing surgery for the first time dislocator, they do less damage and your results are better. So should we treat this like an ACL and do surgery earlier? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, these are the numbers of, you know, recurrence rate. Now, you can see with surgery, it's not 100% either. Nothing's 100% in life, but, uh, you know, it ranges from 4 to 15%. Uh, but that's really good. And, you know, compared to an 80 to 94%, 40, uh, 47%. <clears throat> so, 
you know, a bank art repair, that's what we call an anterior labral reconstruction. Uh, you know, they looked at, this was sort of the most recent big study uh, that was very well done. And it looked at first time dislocators versus multiple dislocators. And they had a 9% in the first time dislocator co cohort and 47% in the recurrent dislocator group. Uh, even more concerning, they had 32% of the recurrent dislocator group had to have a, another surgery, which is not good. Um, so there was another another few studies out of France that have just shown that if you have more than four instability episodes, your risk of having a recurrent surgery is just dramatically increased. Um, so we don't like people to have five, six, seven, eight dislocations. Um, so this is what happens if you keep coming out with traumatic instability. So they have higher instability rates post-op, they start to get bone loss, and then you have to do these big surgeries like you see up in the top right and the bottom here, which is called a ladder J, which is uh, similar to the Bristow that uh, some of the older docs may remember the name, but uh, that's basically a transfer of the coracoid process. So they do have a little longer recovery time. It's definitely a more involved surgery, although we can do this arthroscopically. And so what are the things you bring to think about is if they're having instability with less trauma, if they have instability at a lower angle, uh, if they're having instability in bed, uh, you know, just reaching over in bed, that's a bad sign. Uh, or if they're having a lot of crepitus or clunking, you know, type stuff. All right, so that's kind of our thumbnail sketch of our posterior instability. So posterior, like true posterior dislocations are rare. I mean, you're not generally going to see that in the office, but it's usually a part of the multidirectional instability. But, you know, a true dislocation, you're thinking seizures, uh, electric shocks, uh, big high en energy things. Uh, we see it the most often in wrestlers and football linemen. Uh, so they get their arm in this position where they're trying to block and their shoulder gets driven backwards. Um, there's number is 50 to 80% of a posterior dislocation can be missed. That's that x-ray that I was showing you. I mean, this shoulder actually down here is dislocated. Um, and so it's really important um, that you get this axillary view. Uh, scapular Y view is okay, but I mean, if it's not right online, uh, so it's really important to get the axillary view so that you can see that the shoulders actually reduced uh, because an AP view, it can look great. Um, so the posterior subluxation, you know, usually they're gonna have with their arm like this in front of them, uh, we also call it a Kim test, but they push the shoulder back like that and they'll have apprehension. And that's sort of the main posterior instability test. Um, there's a posterior load shift test, and then you definitely want to do a sulcus test with posterior instability because, again, that's the, that is the most common direction that a multidirectional will go. So treatment. Um, you have traction, external rotation, abduction to reduce. Uh, usually do potentially immobilize these patients a little bit longer. Some of that is because of that uh, predisposition to some overall joint laxity. And we usually only do surgery if they're with chronic instability, if they have significant fractures, um, or if they have a displaced lesser tuberosity fracture. I usually see that in the seizure seizure situation. Um, all right, so I think we're doing okay on time here. So, uh, multidirectional instability, um, you know, is you see that in swimmers, gymnasts, volleyball, general throwers. Um, it is associated with connective tissue disorders like Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos. Um, so typically the pathology is they'll have this really thin inferior capsule uh, 
and the rotator interval, which is the space sort of up here between the supraspinatus and the subscapularis will also be deficient. So when you talk about multidirectional instability, it's always non-operative for months. Uh, no one jumps into surgery on this type of patient, um, especially the Ehlers-Danlos. You know, so you really got to pay attention to physical therapy and rehab. And you know, one of the things I see with my teenagers is almost always physical therapy works. Um, but then sometimes I'll have recurrence and it's similar with patellofemoral pain and they come back and you say, well, are you still doing your exercises? And of course, 90% of the time it's no. Um, and that I've got three, well, two teenagers now and one 20 year old, but so I know how it is having kids do their PT exercises, but uh, that's the key is just sticking with the exercises. Um, so we really only do surgery for patients who failed prolonged conservative management. Uh, this is just a little graphic of sort of what we're doing, tightening the capsule. We can generally do this arthroscopically. You know, what causes pain for these multidirectional instability patients? I, you know, which is, I think a good, you know, an interesting question, because if their shoulder is that unstable, sometimes they've had their shoulder sort of popping out for years since they're 11 or 12 years old. And then sometimes they have a minor injury or they just have some overuse syndrome. And I think a couple of things can cause pain. I think one is just that um, the rotator cuff gets tendonitis and that can cause discomfort. Uh, the second thing is, I think the capsule gets stretched and you do have small nerves in the capsule, you know, and potentially even the axillary nerve, although you almost never get to the point where the axillary nerve actually has a palsy or anything, but they just generally, I think the nerve, the nerves within the capsule get stretched and that causes a lot of pain. Um, we always essentially always get an MRI arthrogram for instability. I didn't really talk about that earlier. I think in general with these instability patients, I'd let the orthopedist order the MRI uh, because most of the time with instability, we do get an MRI arthrogram. Um, it's tricky to order it in EPIC anyway. Um, and you don't want your staff to have to deal with ordering that. Uh, there are times where we don't get a, an MRI arthrogram. Uh, but it is a little bit more invasive for the patient, but it does help us sensitivity wise, you know, and specificity wise, like the studies show up to 20%, um, you know, injecting the dye into the joint. So I'd let the orthopedist generally order, you know, the MRI and make the decision about MRI versus MRA. Um, and that would be sort of my pearl for that as far as imaging. Um, Okay, so oh, back to the pain. So I think it's interesting when you tighten that capsule, the pain generally goes away. And that was what I was thinking is the MRAs, you know, typically with an MDI patient, they're much less likely to actually tear anything. I mean, you might see a reading of a small labral tear, but it is rare to see any major pathology when they have just overall multidirectional instability. There's another reason not to get an MRI right away and somebody that initially presents with, you know, just minimal trauma before they have instability. All right, so it's not just the ball and socket. Uh, so this, we're going to talk a little bit about the rehab and scapular thoracic without boring you guys too much. Uh, so we talk about the scapular thoracic motion. Um, you got to have your scapula and humerus to move in synchrony. Uh, which allows the orientation of the glenoid to adjust in response to changes in arm position. Again, we'll talk about this, the lower traps and serratus anterior. Um, and if you have your scapula retracted, you know, your rotator cuff actually works much better. So you have decreased strength by 23% if you're protracted um, or vice versa here. Um, so you have your maximal strength at neutral protraction retraction. Uh, so scapular dyskinesis is sort of a term as popularized by this guy Ben Kibler here, who's sort of the godfather of 
scapular understanding um, and work. He's a guy, uh, orthopedist in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, so with NDI, they usually have these altered biomechanics and muscle activation, and so their scapula will just not necessarily winging, but it'll sort of glide backwards. So if you uh, have a tight pec minor and lat, it'll increase your activation, and then your lower traps and serratus are less active. Um, and that caught, puts more strain on your rotator cuff and your biceps, and then your humeral head can move away from the center. So besides strengthening the rotator cuff, if you can help that scapular positioning, you're going to have a happier shoulder. So to look at this, you, know, you got to see the scapula. Uh, you look at their resting posture. Everybody's on their phones all the time uh, and on computers. So everybody has poor posture. Uh, so repetitive motions can show weakness. I'll have the patients from the side, but I'll sort of put both arms up and down four or five times and just watch how their scapula glide back and forth. Um, scapular assistant test uh, or retraction test uh, assistance is where you're sort of pushing the scapula forward or retraction is where you're pulling it back. And uh, if you have the patient do sort of an impingement test and, and push down, they'll have pain and then but if you retract it they'll see that the shoulder is stronger um, and they'll have less pain and it's sort of a can be a light bulb moment with uh, the patient and the parents uh, so treatment you just want to optimize the surrounding anatomy um, you want to start proximally and end distally with the rehab um, and we talked about these are sort of the exercises, uh, you know, the low row and inferior glide, what we call closed kinetic chain exercises, uh, doing the lawnmower uh, sort of exercise with a row, um, inferior, sorry, robbery exercises, which are these scapular attractions and you squeeze your scapula together and doing these sort of wall slides. Um, and then you graduate to like medicine ball tosses and uh, using TheraBand sort of plyometric exercises. And that's the benefit of going to PT so that they have some cueing to hold the shoulder and, you know, to keep the scapula in good position and doing the exercises correctly. Uh, <clears throat> another interesting thing with throwers is that often their hips will be weak too. So you see these sort of gangly teenagers. Uh, and their hips will be really weak in their core. And if you, and that then starts to put pressure on their shoulder and then their elbow. So if you get their hips and core stronger, that will help as well. All right. Right at about 40 minutes. So, uh, which is what Janie told me to do. So, uh, summary not all shoulder dislocations the same. Um, not all patients are the same, you know, so really queuing into what their activities are, what their comorbidities are, um, their age, onset, and all those sort of things. Uh, you need to know what direction of instability. Uh, don't forget the scapula. Uh, the, these younger male contact athletes, they really can do more. There's a higher risk of failure with surgery, with non-operative management, and also if they have recurrent dislocations because they can do more damage. And then your rehab needs to be focused on um, dynamic rotator cuff strengthening um, and scapular strengthening uh, and stable, what we call it stabilization. Um, little nugget for Bankart, uh, he's just a little pediatric thing is this Bankart, most things in orthopedics we name after these old guys, uh, but uh, Bankart was 1923 is actually he did the first or described the first surgery of repairing the anterior labrum through an open approach and that's we still call it that to this day almost 100 years later but actually perthes or it's perthes who's a german physician actually did the first one which was in 1906 um the same guy who did leg calf perthes disease um, also was the first person to do, that we know of to do a Bankart surgery, but the Bankart, uh, Dr. Bankart was the first one who kind of popularized it. So that's what we still call it to this day. I meant to bring that up earlier. All right. I don't know if my chat's working or not, or I've 
everybody's asleep and doesn't have questions, but uh, I'm going to open it up to questions. There's no dumb questions. Um, we got 15, 20 minutes here to talk, and if if anybody has any. And then you had a couple of questions for the audience too, right? Oh yeah. Uh, these are these assessment questions that they want us to do. Uh, we talked about this. You know, what's the best position to immobilize the patient's shoulder? after an anterior dislocation and uh, what's the most important restraint to anterior shoulder instability uh, in this AB, ABER position um, hence it's the more inferior than superior and these are my teams and my kids who are a lot bigger now and healthy, thanks to Dr. Kraft. <clears throat> Dr. John, what were the answers to the, the uh, question? Uh, it's a, a IGHL and the, it doesn't make a difference. That's where we talked about it doesn't make a difference if you uh, keep them immobilized in the external rotation. And this one's the inferior glenohumeral ligament, technically the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. But. All right. Anybody have any questions? Everybody. All right, well, um, no questions. All right, well, thanks everybody for, uh,